gives me great pleasure uh, this evening to have the opportunity to introduce the speaker to you, uh, who's a gentleman not unknown to me. I've known him for many, many years now. Uh, he grew up in Atlanta, where his father was a professor of mathematics at Emory University. And his mother was a biochemist who uh, retired early in order to raise a family. Uh, but his roots were in Virginia. His interest in architectural history arose from his many visits as a child to his great aunt's house called Prospect Hill in Virginia. It was built by one of his ancestors in 1811. He received his uh, bachelor's degree, his master's degree, and his PhD from none other than the University of Virginia. Uh, Hal did cross the Potomac eventually, left Virginia, and received his initiation, temporarily he left it, and received his initiation in Maryland architectural history as a Maryland Historical Trust intern. That led to his being chosen to do a historical survey of the Patapsco River Valley that involved not only archival research, but also an exploration on foot of the entire river from Route 40 down to the Relay uh, Elk Ridge uh, area. He updated and added to the inventory of historic sites and wrote an extensive report. The work was so exceptional that we as sponsors of the project took it to the Maryland Historical Society and received their endorsement to turn it into a book. Two chapters were added, and with the help of funds from the Maryland Commission for Celebration 2000, the Maryland Historical Society published the book a year later in 2001. The book has proved very popular and is now nearly sold out. But we have good news for you. You can buy one tonight, <laughs> and here, here it is. You can buy one tonight at $25 each as long as the supply lasts and have it autographed by the author after the meeting is over. Now, it is not unusual for a scholar to turn his dissertation into a book, but Hal reversed the process. He expanded the research he had done that wound up in the book that I just noted and um, undertook more detailed uh, exploration of what had been working in his head. And um, he did a scholarly dissertation which won him his PhD on the Patapsco River Valley. You will hear tonight his amazing findings that turned upside down the popular notion of where the American Industrial Revolution began. We are fortunate to have him here tonight because in the next few weeks he will be leaving the states for five months to do lecturing to college students in Paris and then he will go forth to one of his other loves in Sicily, archaeology. He uh, has been doing this for many, many years. Hal is a very interesting person, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you a fine scholar, a really beautiful writer, and a good friend, Dr. Henry K. Sharp. Please welcome Hal <laughs> Sharp. kind words, and thank you all also for the invitation to speak with you here tonight. And uh, as Charles said, when I was working on the book, I, I found out some things about the development of the Industrial Revolution in this country which were different from what I had learned. And uh, so I think you'll, you'll be pleased with, uh, with the results, and together we can spread the word that uh, the Patapsco Valley is maybe more important than a lot of scholars had originally thought. Uh, can everyone hear me? I don't have a mic here. Uh, is this good enough? Um, I begin here with an image of the famous uh, factory in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, uh, built by Samuel Slater in 1793. And 
I, what I want to do is to trace out very quickly uh, some of the major um, architectural monuments, according to the traditional story, <coughs> regarding the development of the Industrial Revolution in America. And then I'll step back a bit, uh, back down to Maryland and to the, and to the Patapsco, and, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about what developed here. This building that you see in the picture, uh, the uh, bottom um, caption, you can't really see, it says America's first textile factory, which actually isn't true. But um, we can't um, argue uh, too much with, um, with the people up in, uh, in Rhode Island because they are actually incredibly important in the history of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, Samus Slater, his original factory is actually in the core of this building here, which um, has expanded over the years. And this small uh, reconstruction drawing shows the, what, what we think the factory building looked like that's still buried inside of that large one. It's a frame building about 26 feet by 40 feet that stood on the edge of the Blackstone River. And it was here that Samuel Slater actually put to work the first successful adaptation of British yarn spinning technology. So there have been many efforts uh, up until this time to try and reproduce that that technology, and it had not hadn't occurred. Slater had grown up in England, and he he uh, um, evaded British restrictions on the export of technology, and uh, and then uh, was the first person in America to successfully establish this mill. And <clears throat> so uh, the the. the the architectural uh, foundations of, uh, of the Industrial Re Revolution are framed in a way that um, suggests that factories started uh, on a very small scale with wooden materials and then gradually increased in a steadily uh, advancing uh, period of refinement that ultimately led to large-scale um, uh, American corporate capitalism. And this uh, other view of the, um, of the factory shows you that um, uh, it's it demonstrates how the building grew over time. So Slater's small building in the center was added onto on both ends, and then the three-story section uh, added beside it. The roof was raised, and so um, very, um, very early in the history of the development, it, um, it, it began, people recognized how successful the operation was. But Slater himself built a, another factory in 1800 identical to the first, and it was not until um, some years later that his co-investors expanded the size of, of this factory. Next in the tradition is the Lippet Mill, also in Rhode Island, and the section in the front, that is not the wings in the back. This is considered to be the next uh, development. You can see that it's three stories with a fourth under a monitor roof, under that high roof, so it's taller than, the, uh, than Slater's original mill. It was uh, almost um, uh, 80 or 90 feet long, so uh, again, altogether a, a bigger building, um, and that's in 1809. In 1813, uh, Francis Cabot Lowell begins a factory in Waltham, Massachusetts, and it's pictured, it's the building with the cupola on the left in this picture. It was yet again larger, the wooden form enlarged and now aggrandized in masonry. It was a brick building four stories with that two-story garret underneath the, uh, underneath the roof, and uh, was larger still, about uh, 40 feet by 90 feet. And uh, next to it, you'll see a building that was, that was begun in 1816, also by, uh, by Lowell, that expands that form to 150 feet. Typically, in, uh, in architectural history, this is considered, these two are considered the earliest brick factory buildings. That's also not true. But... <laughs> So Lowell, uh, not, not, to, not to deride our, our New England friends too much, Lowell actually was the one who really made textile manufacturing take off. So Slater brings the technology over. What Lowell does is automate all the steps and the, uh, the, all the processes that go from raw cotton to woven fabric. So he introduced here at Waltham power looms which enabled uh, cloth to be made um, in, uh, very quickly and, uh, and very inexpensively. Uh, Lowell dies, but his successors established the town of Lowell not far away on a larger river. Uh, I should say Waltham is on the Charles, and uh, this, this community of Lowell is on uh, the Merrimack River. And you'll see uh, in the background here uh, a factory uh, profile like the ones we saw at Waltham. So they took that model and, uh, and expanded it. 
And one of the things that made Lowell so um, important is that not only did it have uh, a tremendous amount of uh, capital behind it from Boston investors, but they had a very sophisticated corporate arrangement. So the town is uh, laid out here along this canal system that runs from the Merrimack back down into it. And the canal is actually owned by a separate company. And it leases sites to the different investors who build different factories. So the first factory goes in in about 1822. And a decade later, it's an enormous town. They start with about 2,000 population and end up in, in the tens of thousands. It's, it's really the dynamo of, of, um, of uh, American textile um, factory production. And you can see in this image just one of the factory complexes. It's a really enormous, enormous uh, site. So what I want to do tonight is actually correct the story a little bit, but not so much overturn it. Um, there, there is um, there's no doubt that this, that this development in New England, it spread far and wide over, uh, over most of New England and then came down to the mid-Atlantic. Um, it's, it's an extremely important component of the story of America's Industrial Revolution. But what I learned by examining the Maryland branch of that tree is that it's not the whole story. And it's been selectively edited to make it seem like everything was a seamless production from one small, rather insignificant looking building, all the way up to these giant factories that then spread into the much larger um, industrial domination that we know through uh, Pullman and railroads and Detroit and cars and Pittsburgh and steel. So it's not, a, it's, it's not exactly a seamless transition. So my object, my interest in the dissertation was to take the story back further and we go all the way back here to the mid-18th uh, mid century. This is a map of the Chesapeake Bay, what cultural geographer D.W. Minded calls Greater Virginia. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, um, that's not the point. <laughs> the, uh, the point is that the Chesapeake Bay had these myriad inlets and rivers and coves, and when settlement began here, it was the ideal place for um, a dispersed population to, to settle. And the land was rich and people began raising tobacco. So as you all know, Virginia and Maryland were really founded on, on tobacco production. And because of the geographic, the topographical nature of the bay, people could spread far and wide. It was very difficult to concentrate uh, individuals and control the, the trade that was taking place because planters could build wars, ships could go uh, all the way up to the wharves on the bay, or shallow draft sloops and flats could go up the rivers. So it was very hard to impose an urban framework on this, on this society. And one of the things I'm interested in is uh, the relationship between industrialism and urbanization in America, the factory and the factory town. So just very quickly, the basic tobacco structure is that the planters used enslaved Africans and indentured servants. Uh, under, under white uh, authority. They dealt with British merchant houses. So there was very little, um, uh, again, very little uh, impetus to uh, urbanize the, the Chesapeake. Um, the planters traded directly with British merchants, and um, there were very few, there was vir virtually no, no middlemen. Um, you all may know of the earthfast houses. This is something that archaeologists have began to discover with work in the Chesapeake region in the, in the 1970s. And it totally transformed our understanding of what Chesapeake society looked like architecturally. One of the problems in architectural history is that earlier generations of scholars tended to think that buildings that survived were uh, an, an accurate sample of what had been there originally. But actually what survives is the best of what's built brick houses, stone houses, but many, many more people lived in these houses built of a wooden post stuck in the ground, uh, covered with uh, clabbered, clabbers, and sometimes with interrupted sills between the posts, which they could lay floorboards on. Many, many more people lived this way in the state, in, in the colony, as a result, really, of an excess of timber and a lack of capital and labor. So what this did was to free up labor that you would spend hewing stone to make a foundation or digging clay and burning bricks, it was a lot quicker, a lot easier. Intended to be temporary, but these kinds of buildings lasted for, uh, if they were maintained, 40, 50, even 60 years or more. So that didn't stop colonial authorities from wanting to try to impose an urban framework on the Chesapeake. When they thought about a mature colonial society, they thought like they did in Europe, which was to have cities. And this, I'm afraid, rather blurry image 
is the plan of Annapolis, and it, uh, I show it here to represent one of a very few uh, planned cities from the 17th and early 18th century that actually did develop, the colonial capital. Uh, Williamsburg in Virginia is another example, and these two are cities that show plans that have a bit more sophisticated uh, Baroque design elements, that is here, state circle and uh, church circle, the two uh, dominant um, um, institutions of the colon colonial world with radiating avenues going off of them. More often than not, though, uh, the kinds of plans that were approved in the state were like this, a simple grid, often on the edge of a river, and over and over and over again, you can't imagine how many times from the 17th, middle, middle of the 17th century, so the mid-1600s, all the way up through the first uh, quarter of the 18th century, the colonial authorities in Virginia and in Maryland passed town act after town act after town act, and people said no, 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 because it just wasn't in their interest. There was no reason to, to pull together when the bay permitted uh, ready access to, to, uh, to farms. This drawing is just a, a quick sketch of uh, what was the original plan for Elk Ridge Landing that uh, developed really right at the very end of this period in the 1760s, hobbled along a little bit, failed in the 1780s, and then didn't regain momentum until much later into, into the 19th century. So into this environment comes Maryland's first industry, which is ironworking. You all have probably heard of the Baltimore Company, and there's the Principio Company, uh, Germana in Virginia. Uh, this is from the uh, Catoctin Works in Western Maryland, but I show it to you just as an example of an iron furnace. And um, the, not to make too big a pun out of it, but the big irony of, America, uh, of Maryland's first industry is that industry followed an agricultural model. So industry comes in the form of iron production, but there is no consequent urbanization that comes with it. The money that is, uh, that is pulled together to invest in these uh, ironworks generally is, are from the tobacco planters. They produce a staple product like tobacco that's shipped directly to British merchants. Here, uh, pig iron and uh, then bar iron that's made in forges, also shipped by planter traders directly to uh, um, British merchants. So again, not too many middlemen on, the, on this side of the Atlantic. Um, like a tobacco plantation, uh, labor was organized also uh, with indentured servants and slaves under white ownership. They were dispersed, of course, because uh, they had to be located near the natural resources that were used to make iron, sources of ore, water to run the equipment, uh, oyster shell for flux. I won't get into how it's all done, but but what, what really was evident in the, in the 17th and eight, in, I'm sorry, in the 18th century as iron came into Virginia and Maryland is that, is that it followed this agricultural model. So no industry, but, but nothing different. So one of the first documents I uncovered when I was beginning this uh, additional research for my dissertation were a series of plats uh, that were drawn for patent, patents given in the Patapsco Valley. And this kind of insignificant looking document is for a patent called Talbot's Last Shift, which was a tract of land patented by a man named Talbot on the ridge just above present day Ilchester. So if you all are familiar with that location, it was on that, that uh, far side, that Il the Ilchester uh, mill side of the river. And the, um, well not to explain, not to waste too much time explaining, the description there shows what was already standing on the property. And you might not be able to read it, but about the third line down, it says, dwelling house with posts in ground almost rotten down. <laughs> so so it's, it's very typical. This, this document is interesting because it's typical. It, it corresponds with what the archaeologists have found about typical housing in the, in the valley. So the description goes on to include other buildings that were on the property uh, um, related to the farm and also some tobacco houses, uh, uh, warehouses that were, had been blown down by the wind. And the only building that's not derided by the epithet old or worn out or rotten or fallen down is a building called a corn house. And it's the, the whole property is not sited in tobacco land, but in cornfields and, and pasture land. So this, this uh, Henry Ridgely, the deputy surveyor for, for Anne Arundel County, as, as Howard was in, walked the borders of this land and, and noted things that are really very important for us in 1732. And what that is is the very first 
beginning of the agricultural transformation from tobacco to grain, to cereal crops. And it's that trans, tran, um, transformation of the regional economy, in another irony, that brought industry to the Patapsco. So it wasn't iron that brought it, but wheat. The corn house uh, was um, uh, pretty small compared to, the, uh, compared to the tobacco warehouses, but it's just the first glimmer of a change that's really beginning to, to take place. Why does this happen? Well, there are a number of uh, developments that occur internationally. In Europe, the population is growing, and uh, they're running out of, uh, they're, they're exceeding their capacity to produce their own food. In southern Europe, there are a number of failed harvests, and so there's an increasing demand in Europe for wheat. The second thing is that in this period, in the 18th century, the Caribbean is being developed, and so the sugar colonies are, established, are being established. And their climate doesn't permit them to grow uh, wheat or corn for, for food. And so there's a demand there. And thirdly, there is a new uh, wave of immigration to America that actually begins at the end of the, the 17th century with the founding of Pennsylvania in the 1680s, and great waves of English, Welsh and German Quakers come to Pennsylvania, move west, and then come down, the, come down the valley and move into western Maryland. And these people have a long tradition of grain cultivation. They have, uh, through their religious beliefs, a strong uh, sense of community. And, um, and so they, uh, they are actually primed for, um, uh, for uh, a new way of, um, of treating agriculture in the colony. So they don't come from the traditional tobacco trajectory of things, but bring in a new way of, of, uh, of, looking, of looking at agriculture. So now things progress a little bit further, and you all might recognize this drawing from your school books. It's uh, a, an illustration of Baltimore in 1752, done by a young man named John Mole, who later became one of the town commissioners, but when he was a, a young man, he took a walk up to what later became Federal Hill, and he drew the extent of the town as it looked in 1752. So this is two, two decades after the, um, the, the little farm that we just looked at. And Baltimore, which had been founded in the 1730s, uh, about the time that Henry Ridgely was walking the Talbot Place, had languished for about two decades. This, it was for, laid out with 60 lots, <coughs> After, after a number of years, most of them had not been sold, and so to make a long story short, here in 1752, um, there are about 45 houses on 145 lots, and only a few hundred people live in the town. But again, it's at a point right when things are starting to change. This is a, a 19th century reproduction of that drawing that gives you a little bit better sense of the, of the, um, of the terrain. Um, and just to give you a few statistics, so 1752, a few hundred people living in Baltimore. <coughs> um, in, uh, in 1758, uh, the first shipment of grain is sent to the Caribbean. And by 1768, shipments of wheat, uh, that is raw wheat, flour, and bread, equal in tonnage tobacco. <coughs> But at 1768, tobacco brings in about 15 or 16 pounds per uh, uh, pounds sterling per ton, while while uh, cereals are not quite four four pounds. So even though the the production is the same, tobacco reports a lot more income. Four years later, the price of tobacco is going down, the price of cereals is going up, and it's almost equal. So uh, and by that's let's say 1772, 20 years after this. Baltimore has over 6,000 people. And if you follow the trajectory on through the end of the century, um, the population doubles twice, and even a little bit more. So by the turn of the 18th century to the 19th, so 1799, 1800, 1801, the population of Baltimore is 30,000. And the shipments, not from Maryland as a whole, but from Baltimore alone, and not of all cereals, just wheat and, I'm sorry, just flour and bread, are a quarter of the nation's exports. Mm -hmm. That level maintained through the first two decades of the 19th century to about 1820 or so, and um, when the population of the city uh, grows yet again to 60,000. So you can, you can see as you follow that trajectory, Baltimore is really, at, at this point, right on the edge of a tremendous explosion. Here's an image of the city from 1849, a little bit later than what I'm talking about. 
But the same view from Federal Hill, if you can recall the other image, just a little kind of village, barely, barely in existence, and now a major, a major city for the, for the nation. So how did all this happen? Well, this is a painting by an artist named Francis Guy, who, um, sh who, who traveled around and made some landscapes and portraits in Maryland at this time. And in the lower right-hand corner, you see two stone buildings with gables. And across the river is a dam. This is Jones Falls, right outside of Baltimore. And uh, for those of you that are really obscure like me, you'll know that it's called the Hanson's Mill Site. But it had later, uh, at this point, become known as Moore's Mills, and later became known as Burgess Mills. And uh, it's down in downtown Baltimore now. But um, this site uh, also kind of parallels the uh, astonishing explosion of Baltimore. It's sold initially for about 11 pounds in 1711 or so. And it goes through several hands. And a developer named Edward Fell, Fell's Point, buys it in uh, 1758 for 50 pounds. In two years, he sells his leasehold for 1,000 pounds. He, he doubles, I mean, he, he, he increases his return by 20-fold, the cost of the property. So what Fell does, probably, is to build a dam and a mill race. And he sells his leasehold to a man named William Moore, who is an Irish uh, immigrant. Uh, he, He's a miller, and he has spent a lot of time on the Brandywine River Valley, which is the river that flows down into the Christina and then into the, uh, to, uh, at, um, at Wilmington, and drains eastern Pennsylvania. So he has a lot of experience in milling. He comes to Baltimore and, and buys the leasehold. He builds a mill, and he needs um, uh, other investors. And uh, one of those is a man named Joseph Ellicott. And this is in 1763 before Ellicott City existed. So William Moore and Joseph Ellicott and about uh, seven other guys are, uh, divide up this property and um, build the two mills, and the value is probably about 9,000 pounds. So from 1758, when, when Fell buys it for 50, five years later, it's worth 9,000 pounds. You see, see the an astonishing, astonishing change. It's not just the mills that are here, though. It's a whole... Um, community, a small community, there's a, what, what appears in the, in the deeds is a beak house, which is a bake house, a bakery. Um, also there uh, is a cooper who builds barrels, uh, there's a stable for teamsters and horses, all right outside the city of Baltimore. Uh, just a quick uh, outline, this will give you kind of an idea a little bit uh, better of what those mills look like. This is a Pennsylvania type of uh, mill that we look at as kind of a quaint, small, old-fashioned mill, but at the time, in the, in the mid-18th century, this was a big facility. This was a big merchant mill where flour was sold on the international, that made flour, ground flour, to be sold on the international market. You see that there's an arch in the back of it. That's where the mill race ran and the wheel was on the inside to help keep the water from freezing. This is just a quick, uh, it's not the plan of that mill, but it just gives you an idea of an internal wheel type. The wheel is on the right in that, uh, in that section of the, of the mill. So after William Moore and his group and uh, Joseph Ellicott in Baltimore, there is another investor who comes to the Patapsco named James Hood. And this is a print of the area known as Ellicott's Upper Mills. But before it was Ellicott's Upper Mills, it was James Hood's mill. And while the Ellicott's might have built the shop building and the house behind, the Gambrel Roof building is very likely to be James Hood's. And one of the things that's interesting about this relative to Samuel Slater's work is that this building, constructed in 1766, 28 years before Slater's came in, is bigger. It's not bigger footprint, but it has more square footage than Slater's mill. So there is a tradition already. I'm not saying this is the first, but it's like William Moore's mills and like the others that are spreading around eastern Pennsylvania as the, this, this trade in international uh, wheat and flour and bread is taking off. It's of a type that's beginning to grow, to grow and spread. Uh, James Hood operated this mill for only a short period of time. There was a fuller who built a mill nearby. This is a, uh, uh, to process uh, woolen fabric. And also uh, Hood's inventory shows that he had um, materials for uh, barrel making, also for a smith shop. 
and a marking iron to mark the barrels that, of flour that were made. So this, is, this sets the stage for the Ellicott's move into the Patapsco. Georgia, uh, Joseph Ellicott comes down and tries out the territory at uh, William Morris Mills in uh, Baltimore, and then they decide to move to the Patapsco. So it's Joseph, John, Andrew, Nathaniel, am I forgetting someone? I think that's, and, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and, um, and Joseph. But in, in any case, they decide in